Thank you. Good morning. May the Lord bless you and give you peace. I have lived more than half my life as an exile, a voluntary exile. Most of my time in exile has been here in Singapore. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a great place to be in exile. But a man does not forget his home, and I dream of home over and over again. And in this dream, I'm back in my small town, the town where I was born, Eunice, Louisiana, USA. My family home is actually 10 kilometers south of town, and I am on foot in this dream, and there are no taxis. But I have a deep longing in my heart to get back home, where the door is and was literally never, ever locked, the cupboards never bare, and loved ones always waiting. And so, in this dream, I start walking all 10 kilometers, but somehow I never make it because the dream ends, usually somewhere along the way. Once I came close enough to see my home, at the edge of the 100-acre wood that used to be my playground with Winnie the Pooh and gloomy old Eeyore. In another dream, I did reach the house. I opened the door. I saw my mom and others sitting inside, but before I could cross the threshold, the dream ended, and my heart ached with an emptiness that haunts every exile from paradise, a God-given longing to return home. Would you read the text together again aloud with me? Jeremiah 6, verse 16, together aloud, thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Our dear Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. As we listen to your word, we pray that you write your living word on the tablets of our hearts and bring us back and guide our feet in the path of salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Whither the ancient path? Now I know whither is an ancient word. Some of you may have never heard of it. It means where, and it fits well with the ancient path. Now, after hearing this message, some of you will call me old school. I protest in advance. I am not old school. I am ancient path. <laughs> and that path never gets old. I begin with definitions. What is the ancient path? The ancient path is not old school. The Hebrew word for ancient is olam, which means eternal, everlasting, like the hymns we just sang. And I believe we shall be singing for all eternity. Some songs get old, but some of the hymns we sing from our hymnal never get old. For Jeremiah, the ancient path is simply a way of life that conforms to the will of God as revealed in the law and the prophets. Those who walk the ancient path are in step with God and inevitably out of step with the world. It can't be helped. And those who travel this world, this road, escape the treadmill of time and space and walk with God in the eternal realm. As Enoch walked with God, right out of mortality into mort right out of 
mortality into immortality without tasting death. And Elijah mounted a chariot of fire and rode it straight into heaven. All the heroes and the heroines celebrated in Hebrews 11 walked the ancient path. And they still do because the road never ends. And we are not far behind those who have gone before us. But there are many diversions from the ancient path. On Jeremiah's watch, God's people had forsaken God, the fountain of living water, and carved out for themselves cisterns, designer brand cisterns, that leaked and left him thirsty. And after decades of idolatry, immorality, and injustice, the curses of the law were about to break out like a plague on the nation of Israel. And Jesus stood at the crossroads, calling his generation and every generation after his until this generation back to the ancient path. But they said, we will not walk in it. It's no use. We will follow our own plans. Each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Today, we too stand at the crossroads. Diversions from the ancient path branch out in every direction boggling our minds, fragmenting our souls. Relativism, secularism, new age, digital media, curated news, cryptocurrency, digital identities, virtual realities, metaverse, metachurch, plus, 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 and one ring to rule them all. Artificial intelligence. Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, spent decades of his life creating the neural technology that makes AI possible. In April last year, he resigned from Google so that he could speak freely against the dangers of AI. Fake news, fake photos, Fake videos that cannot be detected as fake. You could be featured in a porn video and not even know it. Now, don't think I am naive. I am fully aware, as is Jeffrey Hinton, that AI can be used and will be used for many good things. But the question is, how will we use it. How will it use us? Will we control it? Or will it control us? Hinton and other experts warn us that AI has the capacity to outsmart human beings and eventually become autonomous. And the results would be unpredictable and uncontrollable. Autonomous weapons of mass destruction. Killer robots on the battlefield. When Terminator 8 premieres, it may not be fiction. Hinton and a thousand more than a thousand other high-tech experts agree on one thing. AI poses a profound threat to society and to humanity. One ring to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. Now, I'm not quoting Jeffrey Hinton, I'm quoting J.L.R. Token. 
Hinton said he regrets his life work. He's not the only one with regrets. Former Facebook president Sean Parker laments that he helped create a monster. A key question he and other creators of social media asked was this. How do we consume as much of your time and attention as possible? The answer they came up with was scandalous, is scandalous. Exploit a vulnerability in the human psychic. The constant need for social validation. Someone likes your post. It soothes your ego. And you keep hungering for more and coming back for more until you are addicted. The inventors of social media understood this very well. And Sean Parker confessed, we did it anyway. And God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. And I say to our brains too, not only our brains, but our souls. We live in a society, wrote Thomas Merton. We live in a society whose whole policy is to excite every nerve in the human body and keep it at the highest pitch, to strain every human desire to the limit and to create as many new desires as possible in order to cater to them with the products of our factories, printing presses, and movie studios. Merton wrote this in 1948, as you can tell from the last line. Except for the last line, it sounds as if it were written today. I mean, who needs factories? Who needs printing presses? We have our 3D printers. We have digital media. Who needs um, movie studios? We have lifestyle gadgets. Endless devices with endless applications. We are constantly being sucked into a vortex of IT platforms that are hardwired, designed, engineered to saturate our minds, stimulate our senses, and satiate our desires until we forget God and the urgent need to care for our souls. How can we get back? to the ancient path? Jeremiah has answered that question for all generations. Stand at the crossroads, look, ask for directions, for guidance, the human quest for guidance is universal. All peoples of all races, languages and tongues are searching for meaning, for rest, for refreshment, for guidance in life for direction. Where can we find it? Bruce Olson spent five years living with a remote Indian tribe in South America, the, the Motilon Indians. He spent five years learning their language, studying their culture, their traditions, their folklore, their stories looking for ways, looking for keys to introduce the gospel to them. And one of the keys he found was this. He learned that every Motilon has a jungle trail that he walks. And if you want to get to know him, you must walk his trail. 
And so I say to you and to me and to all of us, if you want to know the ancient of days, we must walk with him on the ancient path. Jesus himself made that very clear. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me and you will find rest for your souls. Those last five words, find rest for your souls. Jesus quoted right out from our text. Jeremiah 6 verse 16, stand at the crossroads. Look, ask for the ancient paths where the good way lies. Walk in it and find rest for your souls. This links Jesus to Jeremiah and to the ancient path in ways that even Jeremiah would probably not have understood. The promise of rest is fulfilled in Christ alone, not in the choking yoke of legalism, but in the easy yoke of loving allegiance and discipleship to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is the ancient path. Faithful and practical discipleship to Jesus is the only way back home. Yes, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. But he warned us all, the way is long and hard, and there are few people who ever find it. So we must stand, look, and ask for the ancient path. Stand at the crossroads. I have spent 50 years of my life doing just that, seeking, trying to stay on this ancient path. And I'd like to share a few things with you that have helped me along the way. And these are all, this is the takeaway of the message. These are the imperatives that I draw from my reflection on this text. First, slow down. Would you nudge your neighbor and say, slow, slow down. Carl Jung, one of the fathers of the psychoanalyst movement, along with Sigmund Freud, said this, hurry is not of the devil, hurry is the devil. My wife cannot forget this quote because, you know, she's sitting at the back here, she, she walks at a faster pace than me, and she's always looking back, saying, come on, hurry, hurry, and I, so I always quote Carl Jung, Harry is the devil. She will never forget it and neither will I. And I say to you, if you're riding on the fast lane all the time, you are on the wrong road. Do things the slow way for a change. Bake a loaf of sourdough bread. It takes time. Time is an essential ingredient to good bread. There's no such thing as instant bread. Sourdough bread, I love it. I have made it. It takes six days just to make the sourdough. It's not yeast, it's sourdough, it's leaven. Three hours for the first ride, all the kneading and mixing and preparing the knead and then three hours, three hours to rise. Then knead it again and three more hours. And at the end of the day, you will taste the best bread you ever tasted and you will never be satisfied with bread talk. <laughs> and not even Tiong Baru Bakery, <laughs> which is my favorite. Slow down. Call a loved one on a land phone or a pay phone if you can find one. Instead of sending a chat, sit down and write a letter on stationery, put it in an envelope, lick a stamp. <laughs> Have you ever licked a stamp? Paste it, post it, and wait for a reply. 
in kind. I've done all of these things. You know, there's something about process. It takes time to make good bread, and it takes time to mature the human soul. But if we're always racing in the fast lane, we will never find the rest that is prepared for us. I was sent to Africa as a missionary at age 26. 26. I settled into a colonial-style mission station deep in the interior. I was entrusted with a Ford Granada, a Dodge Maxivan, a Volkswagen Trekker that looks like a Jeep, two Honda motorcycles that could ride through rivers up to your knees, and a bicycle. I could be seen cruising through that remote town in my luxury car, or racing down a jungle trail on a motorcycle, crossing streams and rivers to get to some remote place where I could preach the gospel. But before long, all the vehicles were stolen, except for the bicycle. And now people who once saw me cruising through town in the luxury car now see me pedaling a humble bicycle. Not quite so humble because it had three speeds. And that was a novelty at that time in Africa. I could pedal so fast that one day a policeman stopped me. Not to charge me with speeding, but to ask me, how come you can pedal that bike so fast? I told him, oh, it's very simple. It has three speeds. He didn't believe me. I had to turn it upside down and demonstrate. And he laughed from his heart. And we thoroughly connected and enjoyed one another's company. In the long run, I became much happier without the vehicles. And I was drawn closer to the community and they were drawn closer to me and they were happy to discover that I was almost human like them. And eventually, I did become more human. And that's what's meant to happen to us on the ancient path, that we become truly human in the image of God. And I learned that if I was late for a meeting, it didn't matter much. I didn't need to apologize or explain, and I wasn't even the last one there. So, I mean, I may have stopped on the way to chat with street vendors, uh, sample snacks, or barter with a salesman over a pair of shoes that I never intended to buy, but enjoyed bantering with him as a way of making friends and without worrying about being late. Now, don't get me wrong. I do not condone tardiness. But please hear this. I found it refreshing to live in an unhurried relational community where time is not money. And I discovered a way of life that resonates deeply with the ancient path and the quiet rest that we find there and there alone. Slow down. Search your heart. What is your reference point? If you want to travel in the right direction, you need a reference point. A few years ago, my wife was speaking at an event for young people, and some of them offered her a ride home. And they asked her many questions, and she was able to answer their questions. And they were astonished at her wisdom, and they said, Auntie Liking, where do you get all this wisdom? They didn't even recognize that she was simply quoting scripture. 
And she said so. Oh, this is all in the word of God. This, the word of God is my reference point. I am just quoting scripture. And one of them lamented humbly and sincerely to my wife. But until I king, the word of God is not our reference point. So what is your reference point? Social media? Artificial intelligence? What is your core identity? Are you branding your avatar? Posturing yourself as an influencer? What is it that drives you? Food and beverage, fashion wear, online shopping, digital media, body shops. Oh, we, some of us call that freedom. But I don't. The highest form of freedom, wrote Jacques Hillel, French philosopher. He didn't write it. He said it in a lecture called Betrayed by Technology. You can listen to it on the internet. I know you don't understand French, but there are subtitles. Thanks to technology. It's not all bad. But I'd like you to read this quote with me and think about it for the rest of the day. Together aloud. The highest form of freedom is the capacity to recognize the things that control us and the strength and the courage to resist them. Now, when do you think Jacques Lul said this? Sounds like today. 1990. Before most of us had personal commute computers or even knew what a handphone was. Decades ahead of his time, like Jeremiah warned his generation and ours too, that we need to get a grip on ourselves. I don't know about you, but I don't trust technology. Don't let it trap you. Get a grip on yourself. Search your heart. And third, simplify your life. Limit your dealings with the world to the bare essentials. Cut off all that is unnecessary and unessential for your salvation and in order to make a decent living and provide for your family. We are in the world, but not of the world. And the Apostle Paul said, let those who deal with the world live as though they had no dealings with it. Yes, do what you need to do, but don't let the world affect your values and corrupt your virtues. For the present form of this world is passing away. I repeat, I'm not old school. <laughs> I know that... <laughs> We can never go back to the Pony Express, carrier pigeons, the yellow pages, and Underwood typewriters. If you have one, pass it to me. I'll take it. We can't go back to that way of life, but we can go back to the ancient path. And if we want to do so, we must not allow technology and social media and the things of this world to control us and to distract us and to divert our attention from God and bring us into bondage and addiction, as many people already are. Some of our nieces and nephews and grandchildren spend all of their waking hours on a smartphone. And God only knows what it's doing to their brains and to their souls. 
We must learn to use such things in ways that simplify our life and not fragment it. Remember, Facebook's aim to consume as much of your time and attention as possible. Why? The bottom line, money, the advertisements that they get. And that's why they are trying so hard, if you read Straits Times recently, to create us in its own image and to shape us with curated news. Do not be naive. Do not be deceived. Make use of these things in ways that make your life better, make you more effective in seeking the kingdom of God and serving others and meeting the bare essentials of life. That's all I'm asking you to do. And this would give us more time to pray, to cultivate our inner life and serve others in love. Fourth, set your compass for eternity. Set your GPS on things above. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has installed eternity in our hearts. Not just a sense of eternity, but the essence of eternity. Take this compass, for example. This is my GPS, north, south, east, and west. Do you know which way is north? You know, I could tell you, go, go west on the BKE and you wouldn't get the joke. Some of us have just lost our sense of direction because we are so over-reliant on technology. The needle in this compass always gravitates toward the North Pole. Why? Because there is something inside this needle that corresponds to something in the North Pole. Pole. And so the needle wants to go there, and it's always ever turning in that direction. In the same way, that spark of eternity that God has installed in our hearts ever draws us on to our eternal home. However, I can tell you, I once had a compass that was fine when I bought it, but it eventually started pointing south instead of north. What happened? Somehow the magnet reversed its polarity and pointed in the wrong direction. A navigational disaster. I have just described to you our fallen condition. Instead of gravitating to things eternal, instead of seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, we mind earthly things. Our hearts incline to all things temporal and trivial material and sensory. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Which mall? What movie? Which cinema? What concert? Which gadget? What game? And we are ever toing and throwing after things that entertain and amuse our restless hearts. Jesus Christ, our Lord, became human, not just to cover our sins in his blood and thank God for that, but Jesus Christ became human like us to reset our compass, to refresh our souls, and to restore us to the path of salvation. This is our way home. Where the door is never locked, the cupboards are never bare. 
and where all your dreams come true. Therefore, I say unto you, finally, stay the course. It's more than 10 kilometers. It's a long, long way. The road is hard. Keep walking and never look back. You will get there if you stay the course. And you will find rest, a quiet rest, near to the heart of God on the ancient path. Stand at the crossroads. I invite you now to stand with me at the crossroads. If you are able, please, everyone standing at the crossroads. And bow your heads, close your eyes, and begin to ask for the ancient path. Plead with God for directions to show you, to help you examine your heart. Would you do that now? Slow down. Don't think about lunch or what you've planned for today. Search your heart. Decide now to simplify your life. You don't need a counselor to tell you the things you don't need. You know what they are. Make a decision to live a simple life. To cultivate relationships. that are mutually edifying, enriching, enjoyable. Take these moments, ask Jesus to reset your compass. That spark of eternity in your heart Ask Jesus to help you become aware of it. And not to ignore it, but to follow it. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will be there, revealed with him in glory if you, if you follow the direction that he inspires in your heart through that essence of eternity that he has installed in the inside of every one of us. Stay the course and never look back. Our dear Father in heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for the incarnation of Christ who became one of us to show us the way back home and who called us to take his yoke upon ourselves and to walk with him on the ancient path that leads to life. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters and myself as well, and all of our families and all of our loved ones and extended family members. Help us all, oh Lord. To walk this road without compromise, to participate in the rest and refreshing that is found there and there alone. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.